You're listening to Talking Joe, and today we are talking Cobra Commander issue two and three. Spoilers ahead, so belt up. A brilliant young nobleman came to my attention. Even though disfigured by a laboratory accident, he was my choice to go into the world to raise a mighty army and to destroy the so-called human civilization which had driven us into exile. You were my hope, Cobra Commander. A creepy science sky, a gun that hair dries. Commander! Commander! Acting out of spite, robots help him fight. Commander! Commander! A new comics run, new stories inside, a new universe that we have tried. Who will look inside? Ladies and gentlemen, Talking Joe is on the air. And nobody beats Talking Joe, an international podcast. Hey, 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 it's me, Mark, and you are with Talking Joe. Today, we are looking at Cobra Commander issue two and issue three. These were released 21st of February and 20th of March in 2024, the distant future. And joining me, as always, it's a teacher who became obsessed with G.I. Joe while researching it, threw away his old life and got lost in his role. It's a real American Tim. It's Tim Finn. Hello, listeners, and hello, Mark. No reaction. I, I, don't, I don't always have time to come up with one. Uh, <clears throat> call me, sir. I felt like it was almost too on the nose, the parallels of, of, of Dreadnoughts and Buzzer. You and G.I. Joe. Oh, I, right. Okay. I was thinking of I was thinking of uh, Marlon Brando's character in Apocalypse Now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you record in a in a darkened cave covered in uh, <laughs> black makeup. The horror. The horror. The speaking of horror, mm, yes. what an issue. We're, we're talking Cobra Commander, touted as a horror comic. And... Uh, it seems to be delivering, but we'll talk about that in a minute. They weren't kidding. <laughs> uh, no backsies. Creative team, writer Joshua Williamson. Artist Andrea Milana. Colorist Annalisa Leone. Letterer Russ Wooten. Editors Sean Makowitz and Jonathan Manning. Uh, and... Let's just round it out with uh, a logo and publication design from Andres Juarez. These things have got pictures what are on the front covers, Tim. Can you tell us about those? Let's have a look at the covers in the gallery. Yeah, the cover to Code Commander issue two, cover A, which is a regular cover, open to order, is... Buzzer, with his chainsaw, using its point blank on Cobra Commander's silver mask, while Cobra Commander is grappling with Buzzer, one hand pushing him away and his other hand outstretched with a little pistol uh, point blank at Buzzer's temple. We don't hmm. see Cobra Commander's front because his, his, he's, he's at a three quarters rear angle uh, to us. There are sparks coming off of the contact point between the buzzing blades and this silver mask. There's a yellow burst behind the two of them, which is not a light source. It's it's an effect, you know, like if if um, someone punched or smacked uh, someone else in a comic book. Uh, it's not like turning on a light. Most of the background is black. There's a little bit of foreground where Cobra Commander is being pushed into some kind of uh, you know, rock or pile of dirt or maybe... Actually, I guess from the angle, he's on the ground. Okay, he's on the ground and Buzzer is kneeling. And then diagonally, sort of sort of disappearing in the black and behind the logo are some trees, uh, which have uh, a similar uh, blue treatment uh, as sort of the, like, flesh tone shadows on on Buzzer. So they, they become a little bit of a design element and a little less of a uh, literal object in the space, though they are a literal object in the space. 
This is a great cover because there are, are some strong diagonals, right? There's nothing boring straight up and down north and south here. Buzzer's expression says so much, right? He's, his, his mouth is open. We can see teeth. He's being both uh, savage and also enjoying himself. There's a real physical tension in both bodies, in, in the pushing and the pulling and the struggling. And, and also seemingly Buzzer looks pretty unfazed by the fact that he's got that pistol pointing at him. Yes, um, he's, he's dangerous, he's crazy. This cover also, it asks a question, which is what's going to happen next, which is, but more specifically, it tells you something that we didn't know before, which is that Cobra Commander's mask is somewhat indestructible which is maybe something that some of us imagined or sort of played our toy games that way, but it's not something I had quite thought about. What's also nice here is um, uh, Annalisa Leone's color work. The, the greens and blues in the shadows are, are really effective. Look at Buzzer's teeth. On the left side, they're white, and on the right side, under the gun, they're blue, which is following the logic of the sparks that are creating a light source. And... I really appreciate the sort of level of color color work here where there are a lot of color decisions being made, but it's not over rendered. Um, there aren't a lot of uh, effects. There are, there are a lot of, there are just a few flat colors. Uh, great cover. Yeah. Speaking of color and design, uh, we've, we've sort of mentioned this in passing before relating to Skybound, but we have, you know, a definite thinking of, of color choices around how the, the color design is sort of uh, like a through line that so the the flash of yellow on the right of this cover informs the cobra commander logo mm. and and the credits page and then also the back cover all in in yellow the sort of the splash of color of red on cobra commander's arms i think is is informing the treatment of the skybound and image logo up on the top right hand corner and and similarly on the next cover issue 3 there's this sort of pink cast uh, and tied to, to Zorana, which informs the pink logo, uh, the pink credit card page and the, the pink back cover. And, and then the these kind of orange, which is essentially the, the back wall is sort of carried across into the logo. So there's there's really nice sort of choices being made around overall design. And, and we do have a credited person for that in terms of having Andre Juarez for, for logo and publication design. Yeah. And you remember in some ID, in many IDW episodes uh, of for Real American Hero, I would comment that the back cover was black with the G.I. Joe logo type. And that's that's easy and simple and it's handsome uh, and and they can just run it every month. And it's one less decision they have to make if the book is you know running late or behind schedule. But you know, why not have artwork for the next issue? Or why not have some artwork from that issue? Or why not do something different for the logo and the, that black solid treatment every month? And here's a good example. And I've already sort of, I've already sort of half forgotten that the back cover of these Duke and Cobra Commander issues is the cover of a manual, which says caution confidential, which is just a fun extra it, it doesn't it doesn't directly relate to the material it's not the MacGuffin. cobra commander's not looking for a manual duke's not hiding a top secret manual it's just one more thing that says we have made a specific decision about this package and we're gonna with paper treatment like how the how the there's some sort of distressing and dirt on these back covers print is a little broken up and and wording and font we're going to make something about this that makes you feel more like you're in it Cover B for Cover Commander 2 uh, is drawn by Ricardo Ortiz Lopez. And speaking of Apocalypse Now, it is uh, Cover Commander, just his head, just two-thirds of his head, having come up out of the swamp. And it, I think it's at nighttime, and there's some grass around and lily pads and trees behind him, and there's a glint uh, on, on the, the metal face shield and some... Um, uh, they're not lens flares. I think they're actually droplets of water on the, quote, camera lens, which are out of focus it's on the sort of bottom and the left. Uh, there's one right behind the D and the E of Cobra Commander. I like this cover. I, I think I'm aware when Cobra Commander's mask 
is sort of ornamental or has a lot of additional edges and sort of bevels. Uh, and I'm I'm always a fan of the smooth, you know, 1982 animated Cobra Commander uh, uh, battle mask. And so I, I think this cover is okay. Um, something's happening with the, uh, there's a little bit of a color shift happening here where all of the black lines, it's like there's a layer of copy and paste under the black lines. And now that lower layer is like pink or magenta. And then it's slightly offset a couple pixels from the black you know what i mean yeah i see it there's like a visual sort of jitter mm -hmm. um and i don't dislike it i don't quite know what it's what it's for because i mean it's just like some visual interest it's just some variety but it seems uh sort of arbitrary and like just cause and cool but also like why cover c one in ten for cobra commander two is uh chris burnham and uh, with colors by Brian Reber, this is this is more sort of presentational. Cobra Commander is in the middle, surrounded by a boulder, some alligators or crocodiles. I don't know the difference. I'm sorry. Plus Torch and Zorana, <laughs> and she's in the um, swamp fire. Uh, it's at night. Um, there's a sort of a green cast to everything. Uh, this is a neat cover. There's no like one sort of bold element to it everything is given mostly an equal uh, treatment in size um and in color though of course because cobra commander is in the middle he's the most important that's a compositional rule remind me is this connecting with other covers yeah Mark? this is a connecting cover across the five issues and it's done in quite a clever way so the uh the tail of the alligator sort of becomes a kind of a snow drift on the left and that big boulder on the right becomes cobra commander's shoulder in uh, issue three. Um, cover D for issue two, one in 25, is uh, drawn by Akko. And this is Buzzer in the 1982 toy packaging style where there's an explosion behind him and, and no background. And he is lit from the left. The camera's low on him. The camera's at knee height. So we're looking up at his torso and his weapon and his face. Uh, handsome strike and cover and then uh cover e by uh, uh nick dragota and uh patricio del pesce is ripper in the foreground with his back to us in a uh, maroon orange cast weapon in both hands um we can only tell who he is because of his silhouette but he's wearing a dreadnoughts uh jacket with cut off sleeves um, alligators or crocodiles on the lower third heading towards Cobra Commander, who's a little bit in the distance uh, at the midline of the cover in the swamp, ready with his uh, pistol. I was really struck by this when I saw it early on in the catalog and then when we got it at my store. Uh, Nick Dragota is an amazing comic book artist and, and has a really great sense of design in his art. And I think this is a weak piece from him because Ripper doesn't quite pass the silhouette test. I think how his legs overlap might make for a realistic pose, but not for a, a good visual. Uh, he looks a little bit like if you tapped him on one shoulder, he'd fall over one way or the other. So well-drawn, I think the composition needs a little work, but uh, well-drawn, well-colored. Nick Dragota made his name on a series, a Jonathan Hickman written series, East of West, which... I had a bit of a cult following. Is is that a favorite of yours, Tim? I I read the first uh, issue and I really loved the art and the color. I haven't gotten into it, but it's a Hickman thing of of interest to me, so it's on my it's on my long list. Dragota also did some work with uh, uh, Peter Milligan and Mike Allred on some of the X Statics uh, sort of spinoffs. All right, issue three. Um, you've already talked about the A cover. I'll just add. Uh, a quick description that Cobra Commander with his mask but no hat or sort of helmet part um, is tied up. Is he is he standing or is he leaning forward in a chair? I guess he's standing. Mm -hmm. Oh, because he looks much shorter than Zorana. I, I kind of guess that he might be kneeling. Okay. Camera is low looking up at them. Uh, she's got her uh, weapon and then behind her on the wall are 
um, several uh, devices you might use to trap or cut up an alligator or a crocodile. So there's there's a suggestion here that there's going to be some um, enhanced interrogation going on mm-hmm. in this fictionalized version of, of this scene. Uh, that pink cast you mentioned is uh, sort of an underlight below Cobra Commander, and it's illumining both both characters as well as informing the shadows on the walls. She's got a look of uh, Zorana looking at Cobra Commander with one eyebrow cocked and uh, a light smirk on her face. Mm. The design of Zorana is, is again leaning into the classified design, which was very close to the original V1 classic design. But, you know, little subtle differences in, in for example, the, the shape of the, the weapon she's carrying and the little flash of silver on, on her, her right shoulder. Um, but so, so again, sort of talking to uh, this Skybound universe um, using the, the classified designs where they can. Right. Um, and then something's going to carry through in both issues is that Andrea Milano draws Zorana with a wide jaw. This Zorana does not have a slender neck and a slender face, you know, with like the prominent cheekbones of a, of a model. Mm. This is a bigger person with, with some muscle and some toughness. Yeah, it's a good observation, Tim. There's, a, I think there's often a sort of a, co- a shorthand in comics where women are, tend to be drawn in a very ubiquitous sort of, you know, a particular type of uh, pretty. And, and he's, the artist here is doing something different. Cover B, I think, was originally um, solicited as by Declan Shalvey, because that's what uh, the Diamond website still says. And, um, but uh, Cover B arrived... Uh, with a uh, with artwork by uh, Paul Azacita, drawn and colored, and another artist who's sort of uh, known for his work on Skybound, working with uh, Robert Kirkman on Outcast, uh, and sort of another kind of oh yes. horror, yes. dark comic, uh, which which became a TV show. Um, I read the first couple issues, and it's great. Paul Azacita did um, a Spider Man arc near the end of the uh, Uber brand new day uh, era. Um, so not not just Skybound, but also... So this cover to Cobra Commander 3 is Cobra Commander small in the distance running away from us uh, down what sort of ends up becoming like an alley of swamp water and trees. He's sort of casting a shadow back at us because Sunset is behind him, but the shadow isn't actually sort of his legs uh, toward us, but sort of four forking tendrils, which suggests, I think, both reptiles in a swamp and also the general threat of the dreadnoughts after him, sort of their mm-hmm. arms. A bit like sort of grasping hands. Yeah. A bit like a reverse jaws as well with that he- that alligator yeah. mouth coming down from the top. So there's an alligator coming down from the top. It's giant. It is not a physical thing in this space. It's not like an alligator is hanging from a tree branch. Uh, it's much <laughs> it's much closer to us than Cobra Commander is. So it looks like, you know, a, quote, photo of an alligator that's been cut out and, like, stamped or glued onto this, onto this drawing, this, quote, poster. Um, and its mouth is open. And so graphically, it's coming down to swallow up Cobra Commander, even though it's physically not in this space and also if it were it would be much closer um and it it is colored in a um a pale pale aqua uh, a grayish aqua and instead of um black inking and lines the darkest dark on this alligator is uh just a, a dark aqua so this cover uh has sort of it's sort of two things happening at once it is a kind of a regular scene of someone fleeing in a real space with these additional uh graphical treatments Cover uh, C, 1 in 10, is Chris Burnham again. Cobra Commander, uh, head and shoulders, reflected, looking straight at us, perhaps leaning forward a little bit. Reflecting, uh, Reflected in his face is Buzzer with his weapon, smiling. And then in the foreground, reaching out past, quote, us towards Cobra Commander, is that bladed weapon, that chainsaw. And reflected in it, again, is buzzer's face with the same expression although redrawn and not a copy and paste thumbs up behind cover commander a uh, little bit of some trees and the swamp fire from the issue two cover and then 
um, some glowing, I'm going to say Energon, and some trees in what I'm sure will be the issue four cover. This cover is to me amazing. I just re- very struck by the little detail in Buzz's blade in the floor foreground. You've got a reflection, not just of Buzz's face, but then a reflection of Cobra Commander's mask in Buzz's goggles, but then a reflection in Buzz's goggles <laughs> <laughs> of, of Buzz himself being seen by Cobra Commander. It's um, an image within an image within an image within an image kind of thing. It's, um, it's pretty striking. There's uh, there's a there's a phenomenon in comics called the infinity cover where a character is holding a book or a comic Mm -hmm. and the cover is that same drawing of them holding a book or a comic and then the cover of that is that same drawing of them and so it gets sort of smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and it often is at an angle so it's sort of like 10 degrees and then it's 20 in the smaller one and then it's 30 in the smaller one and then it's 40 in the smaller one and lots of comics have done this an issue of kid and play an issue of alf an issue of I think Garfield and this is a this is a wild take on that concept and no one's holding a book here right the the reflectivity here is silver battle mask and uh uh chainsaw cover D is uh Priscilla uh, Petretis and Frank Martin speaking of Frank Martin who colored all of East of West here is Zorana getting the 1982 toy painted explosion back uh, treatment. She is kneeling, and she's kneeling and leaning toward us, uh, one arm out to uh, steady her with a big machine gun over her shoulder. And I like this because she's not she's not on center. So for maybe the first time, we're seeing that um, that brightest bright of the explosion back uh, that we think of as so I kind of the Hector Garrido painted explosion that we see behind so many. Uh, toy packaging uh, uh, treatments for G.I. Joe. Whereas the previous variant covers in this style for Duke and Cobra Commander's characters have been uh, sort of on center axis. And then lastly, cover E is the one in 50 variant. This is drawn by Carl Kershaw and it is, it's uh, Torch Buzzer and Ripper and Zorana sitting around or standing around a table in what's got to be their swamp shack uh home headquarters there's wallpaper and uh deer antlers on the wall there's a lamp that's a little askew there's some bottles of presumably liquor on a little table behind them. grape there's soda a... <laughs> right uh there's a doorway uh ripper is closest and he has just stabbed his uh knife through a big snake that is on the table it is reacting in its death throw um they all look menacing there's a little bit of highlight on all of them coming from the, the top right side. And uh, Carl Kershaw is one of those artists who can draw in something very close to American adventure style comics, but he also is slightly cartooning everything. Um, and I think not so much that a lot of people sort of notice it, but just enough that all of his characters look different from each other in their uh, facial structures and you know, you look at Buzzer's chin, right? And that chin's a, a little bigger than normal, you know? He's, he's cartooning just a little bit. Carl Kershaw described this as a tribute to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Hmm. I've never seen that. Yeah, I've, I've not actually seen it myself, so I don't know exactly what component, but it's... Uh... A dozen Talking Joe listeners just made a noise of <laughs> surprise and disgust at seemingly as many movies as the hosts have seen, as many film references they've seen. How have you not seen that famous... Yep. Right. Let's get into a plot breakdown, shall we? Yep. Plot, plot breakdown. breakdown. In the Florida Everglades, Dreadnox, Buzzer and Ripper are torturing arms traffickers, killing one and then dragging the other behind their thunder machine. Cobra Commander and his Minder also arrive in the area, following his energy tracker into a swamp where they encounter a sheriff. While the Minder deals with the sheriff in a brutal way, Cobra Commander wanders off and runs into Buzzer and Ripper. Cobra Commander blows up their thunder machine before running off into the swamp. 
Zorana arrives, telling the Dreadnoughts that p that part of the swamp is off limits and that they need to go elsewhere to a family meeting. Cobra Commander falls down into the waters, which are filled with mutated crocodiles, and is pulled down by them, before Xandar shoots with his harpoon gun and drags him back to bring him to the Dreadnought Bar, where Zorana has unveiled an Energon Cube, a fuel that they intend to sell to the highest bidder. Cobra Commander is tortured for information by the Dreadnoughts, but he is able to play mind games with them, persuading Xandar that his brother has sent him on a secret mission, and then he sets Buzzer against Xandar before he reactivates his tracker. His protector arrives, and as Cobra Commander informs him that they have found the Energon and fulfilled their mission, he tears off his outer shell, revealing himself to be Nemesis Enforcer, and unleashes bloody ruin upon the Dreadnought gang as Cobra Commander looks on, his mask an unblinking, fixed smile of blood. Two quick reactions, and then my larger reaction. Were you surprised when the Thunder Machine belongs to a Dreadnought, seemingly, who's not Thrasher? Hmm. I, I wasn't overly surprised. Because I think they've been, they're trying to keep down the number of characters that are being introduced. And I think having the three main dread, Dreadnoughts, uh, Blink and Nink and Nod, uh, is what, is what they're called, um, uh, Buzzer, Ripper um, and, and Torch, you know, starts with that iconic trio. The other thing, you know, and then we've also got Zorana and, and Zandar and hints of, uh, of a Zartan in the background. But yeah, so so it's it's keeping to the, I guess the order that the dreadnoughts were released and introduced originally, and what we think of the classic trio. But it's it's also linking us back to what has been released in the classified toys, because this is kind of what is informing the look of the the book to some degree. And we've had those trio of original dreadnoughts now either released or or announced, and so we know what they they look like. Um, so, so we've not seen Thrasher in the world of classified, um, and presumably he will follow at some point before too very long, probably in 2025, because there have been hints that a Thunder Machine might follow as a classified to toy before too long. So, with with the that kind of in in mind, keeping keeping it to the original Dreadnoughts and and also keeping it to to characters that have toys in this new classified launch. Um, it makes sense to hold back Thrasher potentially. Hmm. All right, and then my other sort think? of. Um, I, I did this, you know, 1980s kid Tim, you know, the toy is dominant reaction. <laughs> when is it? Is it Ripper or Buzzer? Buzzer, Buzzer, whichever one says, you know, like let's get in my Thunder Machine, or he blew up my <laughs> Thunder Machine. It's not yes. Like, <laughs> that's yeah. It's like where's Thrasher? Like no, you got it wrong. You know, like you're you're playing with toys, and like uh, your your cousin or your parent, mm -hmm. you know, walks in, and they're like, "Oh, can I play too?" You're like, well, "I don't know." And they pick up someone, and they play with it, quote wrong. You know, like I'm gonna get you, and they fly. It's like, no, no, that's that's Thrasher. He drives the Thunder Machine, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Funny enough, I, I I you know have been trying to listen to all of the interviews that. Um, Josh Joshua Williamson has been doing about about his writing on this these series, and he did mention that when um, Hasbro did a recent an, you know announcement of a new Thunder Machine for the Transformers uh, GI Joe crossover uh, three and three quarter line, he was like, "Ooh, Thunder Machine, that's really cool. We need to include that somehow." And uh, so <laughs> he, he in in that respect, he was probably being fairly literal because um, it, it does it did appear very very quickly and, and possibly inspired by by the fact that it'd been have, having this reveal. Interesting. It has been it has been blown up, so so potentially you know somewhere down the line, with the rumours of a classified version of the Thunder Machine, one possibility is that they're you know using and then destroying this classic design. And then when we have the classified version being launched, it could be reintroduced and aligned to that version of the design. Um, an alternative could be they they could uh, relaunch it as a, a literal uh, Transformer crossover with it being uh, oh, wow. Soundwave 
uh, a sound wave thunder machine. Uh, I don't know if they will go to that extreme, but I guess there's now precedent in in toys that if they're if they're in this shared universe. Yes, we we we're, we're not assuming that Hasbro would say to Skybound, "You need to do that." But now no. that the idea is out there, someone at Skybound might say that would be fun. <laughs> Um, my other uh, sort of sort of smaller reaction was, okay, now we know that the grunt, the the minder, mm. the the guard uh, for Cobra Commander out in the world, is not the GI Joe character from 1982 Grunt. Indeed. And the letters the letters page refers to this, I think, twice mm. uh, in issue yeah. three. Because it, yeah, it seems like they're doing everything very deliberately, and so using the name Grunt, you know, did make people sort of sit back and go, huh. Calling him Grunt, what does yeah. that mean? Is he, you know, Robert Graves? So the um, the, the letter responds in issue three, uh, lowercase Grunt. Honestly, I never thought people would think that was Grunt, which inadvertently helped us disguise his true identity. You know, at the same time, when the cover to issue four was um, hmm. posted online, Cover Commander is sort of uh, fleeing someone or on guard against someone in the distance in the swamp. And... That figure is blacked out uh, yeah. for a spoiler. Um, and I think I thought, see, in the back of my mind, even then I thought, oh, that, that's, I wonder if that's Nemesis Enforcer. That just sort of seems like his, his outline. Yeah. I mean, given the story and it being Cobra, you know, La and, and, and Nemesis Enforcer being the obvious candidate for him being the minder, because, yeah. you know, he's part of Cobra La, he's the main character that we've not yet seen. Yeah. Um, he is the obvious choice. And then having this <laughs> this spoiler uh, silhouette, you know, in black to to protect us from the mystery or the reveal, it was definitely a Nemesis Enforcer shaped silhouette. So anyone yes. that knows about GIJ, I don't think would be too surprised by the reveal that, and, and, unless they were del- doing it deliberately to kind of you know misdirect us and it being actually somebody else, and the silhouette was a. Uh, was a ruse which yeah, is always I, a possibility I, I don't have an example at my fingertips but i do feel like one or two times in the last couple of years <laughs> one of the comics publishers has blacked out a character in a solicitation uh and then you know posted over it the word redacted and changed the silhouette yeah uh so you know it's like wait i, I don't see wolverine's claws or fins oh, oh that and later on uh, at the end of issue three, the preview for the cover to issue four does take away that silhouette, and it is definitely uh, Nemesis Enforcer. And when I turned to that page uh, after the letters, I said, "Hey, it's Nemesis Enforcer. I knew it was him." Um, <laughs> can you also remind me what is his name now in the GI Joe uh, toy line? Nem- he's being called Nemesis Immortal as a toy release. Okay, and presumably somewhere, some company has a product called Enforcer. And... Yeah, there's a speculation that it could be related to a video game that uses a similar name. Um, okay. That's uh, thanks to uh, Chris McLeod uh, for, for trying to figure that, out that riddle. But um, he is called, in, in the letters page, they refer to him as Nemesis Enforcer, hmm. uh, but um, he is as yet unnamed in the pages of the comic itself. So it's po- entirely possible they... they go a different route and end up calling him nemesis immortal or, or something so, else entirely so my 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 one reaction or my and my one fact reminder for for listeners who are uh newer to gi joe or don't follow the toys as much this phenomenon of a character's name changing this has happened in the past with uh roadblock there was an action figure of roadblock mm-hmm. re-released in I don't know, 2003 or 2006, and it was the original Roadblock figure, but the the copyright or the trademark, excuse me, um, had lapsed. Hasbro hadn't renewed it or Hasbro hadn't released another toy with that name. And some other product out there used that word, and it wasn't like alcohol or like light bulbs or like shoes it was it was some kind of more toyish uh uh product and so uh roadblock didn't clear hasbro legal and so they came up with a different code name double blast and then remind me is that actually now a different character because they're aren't they both on that um adam rich's cover with every 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 joe oh i don't know i'm not 100 percent sure on that one but uh p- potentially as a different name i guess canon- canonically we refer him to as a 
a different character. Although, you know, most of my, my logic comes back to what's happened in the comics. And right. I don't think they ever had double, double blast in, in the comics. And it's happened, it's happened an awful lot. There's, but they try and uh, get around it in, in various different ways. They, we've seen people being, uh, having like a rank attached to their name, like Sergeant Stalker or slightly different name, like General Tomahawk instead of Hawk. Or um, or they'll use their their file name. Yeah, or they'll use their file name sort of in the in the middle of it. Um, right. Uh, uh, yeah, Has, Hasbro won't release a toy named Jazz, but they'll release now a toy named Autobot Jazz. Uh huh. Um. So so the yeah the Nemesis Enforcer kind of reveal made me did made did make me think about the kind of the experience of reading a book like this monthly as it comes out and the di- sort of different dy- dynamic that that feels like compared to you know waiting for a trade and reading it all in one go so you know you are much more on the edge of your seat for those reveals because you know you genuinely don't know you know reading issue 1 is that mention of grunt is it some sort of easter egg will we actually have a reveal of a character like um nemesis in, in immortal or enforcer or or will we you know which of the dreadnoughts will we see uh if any at all uh, and if you're paying attention to what's going out and seeing the covers as they come out um you know are solicited that sort of you know reveal becomes less less and less so you're sort of You've got this different dynamic to reading a, a trade where some of those more spoilery reveals have kind of just eked out in into the uh, world and, and you're likely to have, have spotted them so it's um yeah a very different experience i think that month on month that that sort of waiting for, you know for the surprise not knowing what's going to happen not knowing where the direction of the story is going to go or which characters are going to be introduced yeah versus reading it all in one go after the event a friend of mine is a Joe fan, but did not read the IDW run, um, you know, kind of wasn't interested and has been reading all of the Skybound books and has remarked to me how exciting it is that the books are so good, uh, both Energon and Hama, uh, but how exciting it is to go to the comic store every week and have something new in these two universes Every week or almost every week. Mm. The fact that we've got these four Skybound Energon Universe series plus Real American Hero means that literally uh, almost every week there is a new book or possibly two coming out for uh, for the Energon Universe and, and a Real American Hero. So there is yeah a real reason for people to be getting out to the store, and it, it potentially is is sort of you know creating a, a, as well as you know regular comic book readers discovering this this world and getting into it and having that momentum of something coming out every single week it's potentially is also sort of you know reawaking those dormant joe fans and getting them back into the shops on a very regular basis yeah i think that word momentum is a good word and i feel like we're in this uh moment of really nice snowballing snowballs rolling down the hill and it's getting bigger because there are second printings and third printings being announced every couple of weeks. And uh, Void Rivals number one just went to a seventh printing. And mm. again, you know, if a store ordered 500 copies so they could get a bunch of the ratio variants, they likely sold the ratio variants and some or most of <laughs> those 500 copies of regular issue one. And maybe they gave them away or maybe they gave them away for a dollar or 10 cents or something. But uh, there's, I still have this issue in the economics of uh, of these additional printings when the books may have sold out at uh, distributor level, but not at retailer level. But, you know, I compare this to sort of when things were at their most exciting with IDW, when it launched its initial three G.I. Joe books, and then sort of the second time it was most exciting at IDW when it bridged Transformers and G.I. Joe and then created the, quote, Hasbro-verse or the Revolution-verse with those other books in Action Man, Rom, Mask, uh, a crossover, and then some spinoffs. And certainly at those times, there were there was you know a book to get almost every week. If you wanted them all, if you could afford it all, and the Hasbro-verse, it felt like it got really big, really expensive, really fast. And 
I don't know why it doesn't feel like that right now. Maybe because I don't know why actually. Maybe because <laughs> we're at, maybe we're at the beginning of something. We're only a few months in, and you know maybe this many months into the the Hasbro verse, the Revolution verse. You know, some people were still excited. You know, I, I realized pretty quickly that the mask comic was fun, but I only really cared when G.I. Joe showed up, which was like two out of the nine issues. And, you know, I like mask. I watch I rewatch the cartoon every so often, but I don't have a collection of the toys. The cartoon's not great. I'm enjoying it as a nostalgic exercise. And this sort of newer version of it was was good, but it, it you know, didn't blow off my socks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. talking about it. I can. Uh, this is in the back of issue three. Uh, I'll do the black writing. You can do the uh, the editorial reply as as they get. Dear Joe team, wow, that page turn in Cobra Commander was quite the surprise. The biggest GI Joe comic shock since Cobra Commander was shot. Pick your favourite time that Cobra Commander was shot. When we were first introduced to Cobra Law in GI Joe the movie, the retcon nature was jarring. Everything you thought you knew about Cobra was wrong. Here, Cobra La is introduced at the outset of the Cobra story, the, an integral foundation to build on and give a new and unexpected dynamic to this universe. The use of Cobra La is also a clever difference between the Energon universe and Hammer's A Real American Hero, with Hammer never including Cobra La in that title. Josh Williamson, the writer, replies, That was a note early on, that if we're going to do it, we do it from the start. Try to have a plan for all these big pieces so we can do unexpected things with them. And as for Cobra Commander's origins, you have your cake and eat it. As well as a disgraced scientist, he is also a human taken in from the outside world. A failed car dealer, perhaps? Building a shared universe, Cobra La and Transformers, slowly from ground up and cross-pollinating, maybe I'm thinking of a spores here, is giving us a more organic, rich and expanding universe, not just separate stories that smash together for a one-off crossover. Looking forward to the next twist you give us, Mark Talking Joe Seddon, Talking Joe Podcast. Hey, I know that guy. Editor Sean says, We understand that not everyone loves Cobra Law, but Josh and I are unabashed Cobra Law fans. Robert, too, it was always where Cobra Commander's story started in our minds, but you can expect a few more wrinkles to Cobra Commander's origin. Cobra Law definitely fits into the world we're building within the Energon universe, and even I'm surprised at the direction it's taking us. And then writer Joshua Williamson says, Yeah, I love that movie, and it's been a blast finding a way to tie together the different origins for the awesome Cobra Commander. Hey, Mark, congratulations on getting a letter printed again. Thank you. This is the third uh, overall since uh, since my letter writing began. And, and um, your second in the in the Energon uh, era. universe era. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. um, so, uh, yeah, so I think what, you know, binding that together with what we were talking about before, the, the, I think what's going on here is, is it feels a lot more sort of organic and we're sort of building from the ground up in a coherent way whereas that kind of revolutions era to me just felt like it was a bit arbitrary and sort of them saying right okay they're all in the same universe now uh it's never been the, that case before and it's never felt like it but now it is and let's just smash things together and each writer can go away and do their own things within this universe and it doesn't have to necessarily feel particularly coherent and joined up but that doesn't matter because look it's one universe it'll be great and it was just too much too sudden and, and yeah sort of the opposite of what, what's going on on here sort of that sort of coherent you know carefully crafted bringing everything together in a in a slow build kind of way yeah so so right now if you are a joe fan you can skip void rivals because the transformer showed up briefly and some transformers supporting characters have shown up a little bit but if you didn't know Transformers, Void Rivals would still work and it would still be compelling. If you are a G.I. Joe fan who's not a Transformers fan, you can skip the six issues of Transformers thus far. You know, like quick scene in, in Duke issue number one catches you up. And so if you are a Joe fan and just a Joe fan, maybe you're reading Hama's Real American Hero, and then you're reading Duke and Cobra Commander. It's not a huge investment. And the, the, the revolution verse at IDW very quickly ramped up with 
six books, six or, or more. And, and, um, and that, that was a lot. Um, yeah. Plus, plus, um, you know, six months in a discreet event miniseries, right? Revolution, uh, which actually I think is great, but, you know, it worked better if you'd also been reading Transformers for the previous uh, year or two. So it's it's not it's not a, an even comparison because we are looking back at what IDW did with that Hasbro set of properties, whereas right now we're still in the excitement of we're only three months in to GI Joe's part in this new continuity. You know, we're only uh, seven, six, uh, seven or eight months in. If counting from Void Rivals number one, uh, plus the skip month or the skip months between arcs. And I think the Energon universe aspect also helps me enjoy ARR a little bit more in some ways as well, because, you know, we've got something different to the side. Uh, and, you know, reading just ARR in real time as we, as we were before the relaunch at IDW, it felt like a really long time between issues because nothing else was coming out uh, or, yeah. or very little else was coming out. Whereas at the moment, it just feels like we're on a fast moving train. There's something, you know, this week, next week, the week after that, and then there'll be more, two more series, <laughs> you know, and yeah, then it'll be a special. And, and then an uh, announcement for second printings or third printing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the, the second half of that little idea that I, I was just on is that we're only a few months into it for G.I. Joe. We're only seven or eight months into it for overall. And I wonder how people, fans, we will feel another year from now when we're we're in it and we've already had some up and down so for example daniel warren johnson the auteur transformers creator these first six issues writer and artist his writing is is quite good his art is capital letters all the way through tremendous transformers comics have never looked like this and from several points of view transformers comics have never looked this good and i i loved all of the art uh at, at ID, i loved almost all the art at idw i loved it a lot and these first six issues of transformers had the advantage of being the beginning with a lot of familiar things so characters are showing up for the first time and we're seeing a couple familiar notes in Transformers lore, like they've only been on Earth for a little while. There's a crashed Autobot spaceship. Uh, the Decepticons don't understand why the Autobots are trying to protect the humans. And that leads to some scenes of small and big drama, right? So there are all these surprises and Daniel Warren Johnson is operating on a really high level. Okay, in a couple weeks, the next issue of Transformers will come out that he writes, but doesn't draw. He's not drawing the second arc. And the person who is, is good. But I don't think anyone is more excited about the artist picking up the series than they were the artist who launched the series. Okay, so period. Second point. In a couple months, we'll be out of Duke and Cobra Commander. And I've been really floored by both of them. They're just working on so many levels. And we'll be into the second miniseries. And I'm very excited. We did a whole mini episode about it. But different writers, different artists, and... I'm already thinking, oh, well, they're not Joshua Williamson. Will they be as as connected? Will they be as cohesive? How much are they keeping Joshua Williamson in the loop? Uh, I like those artists on Scarlet and Destro. Uh, my initial impression is, well, I like those. They're good. I do think I like uh, Andrea Milana and Tom Riley on Cobra Commander and Duke more. So in the same way that the second arc on Transformers, depending on your point of view, may be a little less exciting or a little bit of a step down, or it's like, well, you know, now they've been on earth for a couple of weeks and they've fought the Decepticons a couple of times. So even though whatever happens next could be novel and exciting, it may not be as novel in this second wave of GI Joe. Now, it, now you've got something to compare it to it's like, well, is it as good as the first wave? And so I am aware that we're at the beginning and everything is exciting. And amazingly, everything's been great. Writing, color, covers, art, storytelling, lettering, design. And when you've got a bunch more issues under your belt, you can start to say, well, I like this one more than this one. Whereas like comparing Cobra Commander 1 and 2, you know, that's not all that helpful because it's the same series, it's the next chapter. But like comparing the Cobra Commander miniseries 
to the Destro miniseries, that's going to be a thing that we can do, that people we can do. So I, I am optimistic that Skybound will keep me and many people invested uh, and that all the work, all the work will be quality, but you know, it's, it's going to be up to Skybound to pull that off. Mm. And a year from now, if people loved Duke and thought Cobra Commander was okay and kind of weird or like tried Void Rivals and didn't care for it, they like try Destro, you know, a year or two from now, people may be able to start to say reasonably and organically, you know, not all this is for me or, well, I liked it at the beginning and not as much now or, or I can be optimistic. It's all been great. Let's keep going. Um, and so I'm sort of ready for, you know, in the same way that uh, IDW launches the expands into the revolution verse and then six months or a year in people say, nah, I don't think this is for me or this is too many books. Like, well, that could happen here. Yeah. I think, I think there's an enormous amount of goodwill and optimism as long as the books are, are good and they, they have all been great so far across the five issues that Skybound have, have launched. Yeah. If, if they, if any of the future books starts, you know, for want of a better word, being a bit of a dud, and and you, it's a less of a sure thing that you're definitely going to like everything that they do. It might be some of that audience that's been built up is going to be a little bit more, you know, picky about what they are picking picking up and and, and so on. So, yeah, it's it's not a sure fit thing for for sure. But as long as as long as Skybound are keeping up the standard, hopefully we can keep this train on the tracks. Yes, yes, this Tycho GI Joe train. <laughs> So the high level takeaway for for these two two issues for me is probably more than anything the high level of violence gore and, and this was touted as being a horror book so so just to to run through some of some of the the sequences that we've got here we've got the issue 2 start, you know opening up with this dreadnought torture scene of these arms dealers that that they've picked up there's the thunder machine drag at the end of that there's then this, you know, sheriff that Nemesis takes apart. Then there's uh, Ripper just you know, randomly shooting a guy, guy in the bar to uh, get attention. There's the obvious torture of Cobra Commander. Uh, the ne- Nemesis gets a, a chainsaw to the face. And then there's that kind of body horror reveal of Nemesis Enforcer as he sort of rips off his skin. And, and then the kind of the off-scene killing of the dreadnoughts at, at the end so there's an awful lot there tim what was your reaction to, to this kind of level of violence and gore i i like it i think it's too much i'm conflicted because it is rated t for teen it's not rated a for all ages and in comics you know the different publishers have different words and letter codes anyway this isn't like the Motion Picture Association of America or the ESRB, was it Electronic Something Rating Board? Um, so, rated Piggy 13. So, okay. I'm, I'm actually kind of stunned that Hasbro is okay with this. I think it's really interesting and impressive. And you could argue that the fans have gotten older and grown up. And so you can give, you know, 40 year olds can read these books and it's totally fine. It makes me uncomfortable for two reasons. One, I can't sell these to kids at my store. I can sell Duke, cannot sell Cobra Commander. And I warned a dad off who came in with Uh his, uh, with his, uh, fifth grade. Uh, yes, nine, nine year old, uh, son who had, uh, we had Cobra Commander 1 in the window for a week or two. And then I think when 2 came out, I put it back in the window next to 2. And uh, so they had a bunch of the Energon books. And I happened to walk in and Michael, my employee, sort of waved me over. Like, go talk to them. And so we talked for a few minutes and the dad said his son had kept seeing Cobra Commander number 1 in the cover and was really interested and I thought, awesome, it works. Covers do grab people. <laughs> and uh and I and I and the dad knew G.I. Joe uh from the 80s, but was not a mega fan. And I said, I pointed to Duke and I said, This is this is uh T for teen, this is sort of like light PG thirteen, PG thirteen. I pointed to Cobra Grander, I said, This is a really, really heavy PG thirteen. 
and I like said quietly to the dad, I said, uh, he, he beat someone to death in the first issue and you just see a lot of blood and the dad's eyes bugged out. And <laughs> then I saw on the new rack, uh, GI Joe, real American hero, 303 and 304. And I thought, and I pointed at that and I said, this is sort of like light, normal PG 13, but it's also the 303rd and 304th issues. And, uh, so this story is sort of in the middle of a bunch of stuff that might be harder to get into. And I thought, ah, oh, what can I have them buy? And I like ran over to the back issue bin and we have a second printing of issue two, Marvel issue two, which does have a little bit of viciousness on the final page, but it's implied. And that's what, that's what makes that issue so, so compelling. Like, yeah, they're going to get it. But, you know, no one's chainsawed in half in Larry Hama's G.I. <laughs> Joe number two. And if it happened, it would all be done in like silhouette and like the sound effects wouldn't be very big. And it didn't happen. And then I realized we had Saturday Morning Adventures, one, two, uh -huh. three, four, as back issues. And I pulled those out and I said, this is PG. It's a lot of fun. The artist, he's, he's like, oh, is it like the cartoon? I said, it's exactly the cartoon. Uh, it's in that universe, but it's not adapting episodes. Uh, and he seemed really interested in that. And they were at the store for a half hour, like looking at stuff and talking. And ultimately, I think he got, uh, I think he got Duke one and two, Cobra Commander one that he was going to read and sort uh -huh. of approve for his son or not. And I'm totally aware of the larger cultural conversation and shift where kids who are not 13 see PG-13 movies and kids who are not 17 see R-rated movies. I know this has been happening for a long time, right? When I was growing up in the 80s, I didn't see the Nightmare on Elm Street movies and the Jason movies, but some of my friends did, maybe in theaters, maybe on video. And, you know, I know that a lot of people who'd seen a bunch of Marvel movies who were not like the R-rated audience saw Logan saw the two Deadpool movies. So I totally understand this phenomenon. And we have sometimes grownups who come into the store and they'll say something like, I'm looking for something for my kid or for this kid, a niece, a nephew, cousin, whatever, uh, birthday present, or the kid's right there. And, and I can see the parent is considering what is appropriate. And this is very American. Nine out of 10 times, they're okay with the violence more than they're okay with sex or language. Mm, mm. And, you know, like Punisher and Deadpool, Marvel publishes, you know, whether it's Max or whether it's like Wolverine, the monthly Wolverine right now, which is like T plus parental advisory, not for kids. Marvel doesn't have any cursing, even in like Punisher Max. Okay, so back to back to G.I. Joe. I think Cook Commander is a really compelling book. And I think the Dreadnoughts actually would be this awful. And I've always been aware that Larry Hama is doing a version of them that's both, quote, appropriate for kids and also him sort of like pointing. He's like offstage pointing at the actor on stage. He's like, you see what I'm doing? It's like, it's grape soda, right? It's not beer. Like, as you said at the beginning of the episode, it's like, this is what we're doing. It's like, he understands the, he he, he made the joke. He understands the joke. He, he like recognizes a little bit of the facade but um yeah i think you know in terms of the the cartoon and and also for the most part comics that that you know larry hammer has never uh, hasn't really particularly portrayed the dreadnoughts as being very nasty or or a real threat menace that you know, maybe a little bit more in some of the earlier issues where they're sort of they're on the on the road and they're sort of just almost attacking bystanders just for, for larks. But out, outside of that, it's a little bit, you know, a little bit less of a, an edge to them. And, and I guess so this is, again, you know, just as the writer is making a point of the Cobra Commander here being different to the retreat Cobra Commander that, that we're more familiar with, that they're kind of re uh, recentering the Dreadnoughts as being a little bit more of a, a threat and, a, you know, just a nasty bunch you know, everyone lived through the pandemic. This is a post 9-11 world. There are school shootings. Uh, there are there are terror attacks. There are there are wars going on and they're covered not just because of the 24 hour cable news cycle, right, which is invented with CNN in the early 80s, but 
accelerated with social media, you know, like people can know what's happening in other parts of the world immediately and often live, not even walking past a storefront with TVs or at home, but like in their pocket on their phone. So I understand that maybe the whole level of sort of uh, viciousness or violence in the actual world might be somehow reflected in this fictional world. We, we just see more, we absorb more uh, violence. And, you know, I'm, I'm writing a G.I. Joe history book and a very light undercurrent of it is the criticism of the show or concern about the toy that it's a, quote, war toy. And I understand that these comics are not to the toys. And uh, maybe everyone's okay with comics with lots of punching and blasting and blood because that's what they've always been or that's what people think they are. And maybe everyone sort of assumes that like the kid, the, the right audience is finding the, the, the stories. Whereas toys, it's like, no, our innocent children, our toys can't come with guns and our toys shouldn't be guns. Um, but I felt for a long time like G.I. Joe is a little vulnerable in a way that Transformers and Star Wars and Marvel aren't. Maybe G.I. Joe is a lot vulnerable because with Transformers, well, they're just robots. And with Star Wars, well, it's the space Nazis that we're shooting, right? The Empire, those are space Nazis. And the Stormtroopers, those are bad guys. So it's okay to blast them. And also it's a blaster, right? Like a glowing line hits them and they fall over. They don't scream much. There's no blood. And, uh, you know, with Marvel, it's like a lot of punching and flying and blasting. And with G.I. Joe, it's firearms and incendiary devices, which is which is very different. And in the back of my mind, I'm reading Cobra Commander 2 and 3, and I'm thinking, is someone going to make a crusade out of this? Is someone, is a, is a social critic or a teacher or a crusading district attorney or a religious le leader, or a librarian, or a teacher, or a concerned parent going to hold this up and say, this is savage. Uh, you know, we can't be showing this to our kids, right? And then the counter is like, well, it's rated teen, so it's not for, quote, kids. And, you know, I think we all know that the classified toy line is selling more to collectors, and maybe almost exclusively to collectors, and not a lot to kids so i really like this story but i can't help but think like oh man skybound joshua williamson what would could you could you make this cobra commander as menacing and my favorite cobra commander scene in these two issues is actually involves no blood no blood at all skybound and joshua williamson can you make this cobra commander as menacing can you make these dreadnoughts as terrible and can you make the threat of Cobra Law as dire with more suggestion, you know, like mm. more happening off panel, tone down the sound effects, less actual blood and like red, red ink, less like dismembering. And it's like, no, Tim, this is a horror book. And I thought, <laughs> yeah, I sort of assumed it was a little bit more like cosmic horror, like it's the ancient monsters and gods of Cobra Law. Like, oh, you mean like like slasher film <laughs> you mean like, oh, literal they're cutting... texas chainsaw massacre horror yeah they're yeah. they're cutting people up so i don't i don't want to sound like a prude like i'm not wagging my finger and saying you shouldn't do this my eyebrows are up and i'm thinking is this okay i don't want you to get in trouble and i think they know what they're doing these are great comics and hasbro has signed off on this and i i i always think about gi joe as in a different place than some of the other Hasbro brands or brands that Hasbro has the toy license for. Can I take a guess as to the um, moment that you liked from Cobra Commander uh, as yeah. a character that didn't have any blood in it? Yeah, yeah. Was it the moment where they are rocking up to uh, see the boat rides and see the, uh, to, where they're having the boat rides uh, with a sign promising to see the gators and there's a little kid there with a giant cup who's um, sticking his tongue out at cobra commander and cobra commander kind of just reaches out <laughs> his hand at the boy and then his mind says don't cobra commander replies i hate it here yes yes it uh, yes it was 
uh, if not for all of the um, tremendously vicious murder in these two issues, this is the scene that would like keep coming back to me. And underneath those murders, this scene does keep coming back to me. We've seen, we've seen a GI Joe. I know the soundtrack to this scene. We've seen very briefly uh, in the world of GI Joe, a carnival. It's in one of the PSAs for uh, what to do if you're separated from your, your family or your friends, the kid who gets lost. So like, I can hear that little bit of music in that public service announcement. Stay close, Tony, so you don't get lost. Hey, look at that. I can do that. Hey, Mike! Where are you? Mike! Hey, get, take it easy. But I lost my brother and... Stay calm, think. Where did you see him last? Go back there. If he doesn't come back, ask a policeman for help. Hey, it's Alpine and my scared brother. It's not scary being lost if you don't lose your head. <laughs> now I know. And knowing is half the battle. G.I. Joe! These two silent panels where the kid sticks his tongue out and we're higher than him and Cobra Commander and we're looking past Cobra Commander to see him seeing the kid. And then that, that panel under it on the bottom of the page with his hand. And then the interruption, don't. And then Cobra Commander has already made it like six steps away and there's no exclamation mark, right? And he's saying it as, as much to himself and us as he is to his minder. I hate it here. And I thought, great. And then what happens, the next panel, it's really tiny, but he's pulling something out of his coat. And then the next panel, he uses this like energy blade to cut through a chain link fence. Mm. And um, just a nice little bit of storytelling, a little bit of progression here. You know, besides the big moments and the big reveals, you know, like a two-page splash for the Thunder Machine, a two-page splash for a nemesis enforcer shedding his skin, you know, uh, the the appearance of of pythona and this horrible mutation she's doing to someone yeah i don't know tim if you've um done your homework and and read forward for for dark horizon yet from devil's due but there's it struck me that that pythona scene um of kind of transforming nemesis enforcer is is there's a little bit of similarity to a, to a story beat within that story where uh kind of it's Im- implied that perhaps nemesis is is this kind of Kobala warrior who's almost he was almost treated a bit like the winter soldier that he's kind of on ice and and kind of taken out of the equation until they need him you know to draw upon him to do a kind of specific task because he's not the you know he's not the kind of character that you would need around during peacetime you you only need him when things are getting a little bit uh <laughs> fighty uh, I have not reread Black Horizon recently, but I am a fan of it because of it, the Andrew Wildman work. So I look forward to uh, making some Cobra Law comparisons when we get to that. Um, just my last little point about uh, the violence. Something that I'm aware of in the last many, many years is the the creep of what's allowed in a PG-13 movie. Things that were allowed in PG-13 movies 30 years ago, excuse me, that weren't allowed in PG-13 movies uh, 13 years ago now are, and things that would have made a movie R 30 years ago oftentimes get a PG-13 now. And, you know, it's the standards aren't quite written down. Uh, if you're If you're a producer or a studio submitting a film to the MPAA for a rating, uh, you don't always get a full explanation. And when you appeal... It's it's somewhat mysterious, but an example that I that I often think of is Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight, which has three or four really affecting scenes of terror and menace where someone does something really terrible. And the mood in the audience, I've seen that movie in the theater a couple of times. Everyone is tense and uncomfortable and it's it's terrible, right? And that makes sense because, you know, the villains in those Batman movies, particularly that one, they're great and they're terrible. And I have always felt like that movie is actually like PG-15, which is not a real rating. But like to me, that movie is not PG-13. It technically is PG-13 because there is no blood. Shockingly, right? Bank manager in the opening scene gets shot in the gut with a shotgun and there's no blood and there's no cursing. And so if you take those two things out, right? And and of course there's no nudity and there's 
sort of no sensuality, right? There's no like someone like getting undressed a little bit while making out and starting to have sex, but not having sex. So what you have is this bloodless, curseless violence. And so it's like, oh, well, on balance, that's PG-13. But I, f I actually find the tone of that film to be like definitely an R-rated movie. And when it came out, I was excited because this was a really powerful, affecting Batman movie. But it also, in the way that I'm describing Cobra Commander, the miniseries, maybe a little uncomfortable because I thought, well, if I had a, you know, seven-year-old niece or nephew, and there are some BG-13 movies where it's like, oh, I would take them to like the Sam Raimi Spider-Man. But there's a big difference between Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight and, you know, Marvel movies in in sort of the the like the meanness of that of that antagonist. And so so, Mark, how do you feel about all this blood and killing? Yeah, a, a sort of similar similar kind of thing. I sometimes I'm sort of a little bit taken aback at times and going, whoa, is this too much? But. Uh, you know, it, it's ha handled pretty well most of the time. I think they're they're definitely walking a fine balance, and I get more from some of the undertones, some of the creepiness, than, than necessarily the the full on gore aspects of that. They, I think those are the more impactful elements. Yeah, can I can I jump in the the bit where um. The, the the page in issue three with the nine panel grid, which is a montage of torture. It's not like nine sequential panels and it's like moment to moment. This is like hours of all the dreadnoughts taking their turn and using their different weapons on Cobra Commander. The page after that, where Ripper sticks his finger mm. onto or into Cobra Commander's arm wound to get blood on his index finger. And then he draws that smiley face on Cobra Commander's mask. What he's saying is really dramatic. Listen, mate, if you tell us who you really are, what you're doing out in our swamps, I promise you'll be much happier. And happier lines up with camera pulls back and we now see the smiley face. But Cobra Commander's leaning forward, probably because he's a little tired. But the, the interplay between that word balloon that we see Cobra Com Commander smiling, but he's not actually smiling. That's just stuff on his mask. And we don't actually know what he's thinking. We don't actually know how he feels. There's also this sort of exaggeration where I guess this Cobra Commander can't feel pain because he never reacts. He doesn't, he doesn't scream. He doesn't say, no, 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 please stop. He doesn't have them stop and give them what they want. And so the, the pages of them torturing him end up feeling what's the word like maybe maybe too much because it's like if it's not actually working on him then is joshua williamson being gratuitous mm. you know what i mean it's like wouldn't they give up sooner yeah but if, if if you're spending a whole two pages on this are you doing it sort of for quote the reader's benefit which is sort of awful yeah, there's a couple of things here that that you mean you can't see his face, so you don't know what's going on under that mask. But once he has that smile sort of painted on his mask, you do kind of project that onto Cobra Commander that he's almost sitting there or standing there with a with a smile on his his face. And certainly at the very end of the the issue, that you 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 know you are projecting that smile that he's almost you know he's he's tied up, he's being tortured, he's in a position ostensibly without any power uh, and yet he's there sort of sitting unblinking uh, and smiling back at them and th there's this you know point towards the end of issue three where cobra commander sort of touches you know moves his middle finger and touches a, a thing on his his col on the um his cuff a little red button and it goes beep and zarana says what did you just do what do you think i just did this, so this is him reactivating the tracker that he had turned off that allows then his minder to find out where he is. And presumably this entire time that he'd been tortured, he could have done that and, and let, let Nemesis know where he is and, and get out of that position. So he, he's almost a, a complicit kind of uh, part of this, this torture that he's he sat there using it as a way to gain information and again power 
despite seemingly being in a position of of a, a lack of power. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the power dynamics in these scenes are great. And Joshua Williamson writes a great Killer Commander. And that's a good point that he, he could have presumably sort of ended this much earlier or at any point. And yeah, the, just the the power from De Cobra Commander here is mostly a sort of a psychological power that he's playing these the various dreadnoughts off against each other, getting them to fight within uh, amongst each other, playing real mind games and, and sort of establishing himself as a, a bit of a master manipulator. I guess, you know, in issue one, he's kind of got himself out of a death sentence with a bit of manipulation of Golobulus. And, and here he's sort of got everything he needs to know about the, the dreadnoughts from just, you know, sitting in a chair and being tortured by them. And then... Williamson tr- treats us all like a smart audience because immediately Zorana sees what's happening when the door busts in with three of the dreadnoughts now fighting each other and she yells, stop, you let this outsider manipulate you like this? I appreciate that. That didn't go on for any longer. I, mm-hmm. I mean, I would have enjoyed more scenes of Cobra Commander starting to play them off of each other, um, getting, getting them to doubt each other. But Zorana's smart. <laughs> and she's going to see what's happening and know that they're acting out. They're acting strangely because of this additional, because of this X factor in the scene. It's not like three issues later. She's like, wait a minute, that guy in blue manipulated us. It's like, no, this is immediate. Uh, so I really appreciate that. And he's, he's he's sort of gleaming these bits of information to manipulate them from, you know, overhearing what they've been saying either about their other brother or, or you know picking up on Zandar's sort of dislike of buzzer and, and speaking of which they Drana and Zandar do talk about their other brother you know with the implication that we are guessing that is Zartan they say what sh- should we tell brother are you mental we can't risk blow- blowing his cover because somewhere Zartan's undercover Zartan's undercover have we seen him already in one of these other comics my shall i tell you my spoilery idea tim uh i think he's in void rivals he's one, <laughs> he's one of the guards at the wall uh by the like border to the northern uh wastelands no okay what's what's your guess uh my guess could he be mercer huh interesting under undercover at uh working for for destro because they're you know they're talking about you know the energon power and that uh, they you know they got it they can sell it to highest bidders for a pretty penny presumably as the you know arms dealer with a pretty penny himself there's destro if they sort of ensconce themselves in with destro they can uh you know gleam gleam some information to help uh you know sell that energon and make well, a make more money well, Some well of our two two talking Joe hosts can play that game. I think Zartan is undercover as Major Blood. <laughs> um, I actually think that we haven't seen him yet, or if we've seen him, it's he's in in a, in a background of one panel, and we don't know that he's someone specific, or there, there's no sort of good hint yet. Um, maybe he's Cover Girl. Maybe I have a favorite panel of art in these three these uh-huh. two issues, and I just want to say again. Milana's art is so great. Um, it is, his inking is, it's not messy and it's not even, I wouldn't even quite call it stylized. I mean, all art is stylized, but it's slightly loose and, and yet confident. Yeah. So it's not like loose, messy or loose doesn't quite know what he's doing. In issue two of Cobra Commander, on the third page, which is the one after the big splash of uh, looking up at the two dreadnoughts, the final panel is Buzzer having gotten into the Thunder Machine and Ripper getting into the Thunder Machine, but he's cropped at head and shoulders and he's turning back to us. They're both smiling. Their smiles are a little different from each other and Ripper has this sort of delighted disbelieving 
uh, sort of reverse furrow to his brow, the way that his eyebrows are up. And I just think that this panel, this is not the most interesting or important or exciting panel of these two issues. And, and I think plenty of panels and pages in these two issues are really compelling and beautiful and cool and fun to look at. Something about this panel, because of the composition, the sort of dominant two thirds with one dreadnought and then another dreadnought and the other third, and he's there, he's back a little bit. That line, something about that line, that triangular line, that upside down check mark on uh, Ripper's eyebrow. I just, and then the like the slightly sort of broken, thick and thin inking on the edges of their arms and their hands. I just really, really uh, like this, and and I don't have any better words for it, but. The inking about it looks uh, like some European comics artists, and they can't quite place where. Doesn't quite look like American comics, you know. This isn't or or British uh, comics, you know. This isn't like Paul Neary or Mark Farmer inking Alan Davis. This isn't like Todd McFarlane inking himself. This isn't like Randy Randy Emberlin inking uh, Mark Bagley or Mark Bright. Ah, it's great. <laughs> And I'll just call out as well that panel that we're talking about where Ripper's got this sort of like tattoo that maybe looks a little bit like Krampus or something that um, that is taken from his classified design. So again, you know, it's that linking of the character design back to the to the classified. Um, you know, this starts to beg the question, are the artists drawing these books, have they been sent toys? Have they gone and gotten toys themselves? Has Hasbro or Skybound sent them classified designs like 3D renders or, uh, you know, drawings? I it's, wonder what it's they're in, working from. It's entirely possible, but but there's also, you know, the, the very high quality images of all of these toys that are sort of put out when the, the characters or the uh, are sort of released with render reveals or um, actually released for sale with package images and then also diorama images and, and things as as well right. so there's a lot of high quality digital assets that are publicly available that they can use i think my favorite page is probably the last page of issue three with cobra commander sort of stood there uh, unblinking uh, unknowable as as nemesis enforcer you know, rips into the dreadnoughts and you know, presumably is killed at every single dreadnought. <laughs> yeah, I think. Except for. Except, except for all of the for, named ones. Yes, because a couple pages earlier, you see them all. It's that same page where you pointed out Cobra Grander pushes a button on his cuff. And at the bottom of that page, the the five marquee dreadnoughts with Cobra Commander are heading towards the exit. And then we're outside and we see one, two, three, four, five, six other generic dreadnoughts and a hog motorcycle uh, with, uh, it's not the dreadnoughts toy uh, motorcycle, but a, a motorcycle that has some slightly toyetic colors uh, in the background all the way on the right side. Uh, yes, presumably it is just those uh, generic ones who who get torn apart. And uh, this last page again does something that, issue one did when we sort of first saw the the hint of what cobra commander is capable of where the violence is happening off screen with um sound effects i will say though all right so this this page in and of itself the final page of issue three if you're gonna have all this terrible violence uh i guess i'd prefer that it happen off panel and you just see someone reacting to it or not reacting to it and sound effects and, and word balloons than, than actually seeing it, than seeing, you know, Nemesis Enforcer like tearing limbs off. And uh, I mean, you know, in issue in issue two, when he headbutts the park ranger, yikes, uh, it's a little <laughs> hard to talk about. Like on the one end, it's like, cool, blood and guts. You know, like when I was younger, I drew like blood and guts drawings and I drew a couple blood and guts comics and I have occasionally enjoyed blood and guts movies but he like headbutts the guy so hard the guy's head either sort of explodes or like deflates or gets like pushed down into his torso if you look at the next panel uh yikes and simultaneously pulls his arms off right 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 it's like wow but the cobra commander mask right he's got this sort of 
you know, Mark down it that that it, we get some POV shots looking out of the mask oh, the, through the, the hole. The gash. The gash. The, the gash yeah. from the chainsaw. Uh, I think it was caused by torch, sort of oh, melting okay. his mask. Uh, y- yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then with the with the sort of the, the bloody eyes and smile sort of on on the mask, I couldn't help but think of Watchmen again, where there's that iconic smiley badge with the top left down to bottom right sort of splatter of of blood you know here we kind of got the reverse that the eyes and the mouth are drawn on in blood and and it's the uh the, the gash uh is is not red yeah and i guess if we're making watch and watchmen comparisons this does slightly also recall rorschach who has this mm-hmm. unknowable face because he's got this changing mask uh and so here in Cobra Commander at the end of the issue with the blood, with the gash is, I don't think this is a direct Watchmen reference. I think this is a thing where you can say, oh, this reminds me of Watchmen. This is like an inadvertent uh, uh, reference, but this that sort of ends up being sort of two things in one. Uh, uh, yeah. And like, I, th- yeah. I think it, is it one of those almost instantly iconic looks. I've already seen someone post some toy recreations of this look with um with Cobra Commander with with the sort of red painted on and a, and a gash added um I can only imagine there'll be plenty more to to come and, and cosplays and, it's and yeah it does seem like yeah. instantly this is this is something this is something that's a little bit special and a bit unique and and will be remembered I I wonder if uh this this cosplay that we might see in person or photographed on the internet will be Cobra Commander with that mask treatment and just that mask treatment, or also with torn clothes and some blood and some chains. B- back to the, uh, the the headbutt and and the final page uh, of issue three, I think about this thing you can do in comics and in movies where something terrible happens and you don't show it. You either show the shadows of it cast on a wall or you show someone's reaction, you know, like someone seeing the terrible murder and their eyes go wide and they bring their hands up as you hear the sounds of someone pleading and being murdered. And, you know, like comics people and TV and film directors have known this for a long time. It, it can be worse in the audience's mind if you don't show it, because then the audience imagines it as bad as they can imagine it. And I think sometimes of uh, of Batman, the animated series, and how the standards and practices at Fox, this is in 1992, had all these rules about what what Batman could and couldn't do, the character in the show. Like, Batman couldn't punch directly to the face. And I think he does maybe once or twice. But you see that in G.I. Joe. You don't see that in Batman, the animated series. But there's, like, kicking to the stomach instead or... Like, all right, well, Batman doesn't punch this bank robber in the face, but instead the bank robber runs at him and Batman like flips him over his shoulder and throws him against the wall, which actually might be worse. And sometimes you just see the shadows cast on a wall or sometimes you just hear it. And I also think about in Batman, the animated series, the one or two times that the show creators wanted to depict Bruce Wayne's parents murder and how they do so indirectly. You know, you don't see two people in an alley get shot, but you see two people or you see a gun or you see an alley or you see Batman just panicking, right? As he's in a like scarecrow induced hallucination or having a nightmare, whatever it is. And I think this is the kind of thing that we've been used to for a long time in G.I. Joe comics where like it's combat, it's war. Sometimes a character just gets shot. But when there has been something sort of worse than that, you sort of show around it and now we're just being shown it. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm torn because like almost half of all my GI Joe thinking is about the other audience. Like I'm taking it in, you know, images of the new toys, uh, all the comics, I'm taking it in as a fan. I want to know the stories and see what's happening. But I also think about selling it at my store or, talking to people I know who are lapsed fans, or if someone says, oh, what do you do? Well, I'm, I'm writing this G.I. Joe history book. 
Oh, G.I. Joe, huh? Oh, no, it's fascinating. Let me tell you, the show was innovative and the toy was innovative and the comic was really excellent and all this and all this. And I'm trying to sort of spread the good word. And I may not be able to sell some random person I meet who asks what I do on the new comics, but, you know, you meet someone and they've read comics before or they're a lapsed G.I. Joe fan. And wouldn't it be cool in 2024 to say to more people than it seemed like we could do three years ago, five years ago. Oh, you should really get into the Joe comics. They're great. Or, oh, they, they started over. It's a great jumping on point, right? Like, well, I have a nephew. I don't know if I want him to read Cobra Commander. You know, I definitely want him to read Duke. And that sort of hurts because if someone has the money to read all of them, I want them to read all of them because it's a larger story. Like, oh, well, you can read this PG-13 one, but yikes, don't read that PG-13 one. Tim said to the dad at his store. <laughs> Got it. Shall we get on to some Ice Spies? I know we could talk about this this comic in depth for forever, but <laughs> let's, um, should we pick out some little details? Sure. I, I spy, spy with, with my little eye. eye. So the first one was that they would... T- less a nice buy more story point but they talked about that part of the swamp is off limits so a little bit of a mystery and and also i guess these badasses talking to to something out there that is probably even more dangerous than themselves And, and with these kind of giant mutated crocodiles i was kind of expecting croc master to show up in issue three to be honest hmm I had assumed that that's where the Enerajan is, and these Dreadnoughts are only allowed to do some things with the Enerajan, mm. and someone else, like Zartan, is the one who goes in and really deals with the Enerajan. Mm. Yeah, too powerful, too valuable for any old person to go rooting around for it, perhaps. There, in, in issue one, these um, arms uh, smugglers... They talk about uh, somebody. They say, uh, when they're talking about who um, who they were working for, they say, he never told us his name, just some big dude with a flat top. We were supposed to meet him in Orlando. Big dude with a flat top? Road pig. Oh. Uh, so what do no. you say? Mercer. Huh. Some big dude uh. with a flat top. Yeah. Mercer. I instantly thought road pig. But mm. Um, mm. yeah, Mercer could work as well. Um, well, while we're going deep, are there any Joes? Are there any big Joes with flat tops? Maybe maybe this is a cops crossover. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Berserko doesn't have a flat top. Rock Crusher's bald. <laughs> um, Did you notice in issue two when Cobra Commander went into that swamp shack that, uh, so so he's, you know, it's that gruesome scene where You've got sort of bits of body dangling from the ceiling. Did you also notice a familiar looking kind of mask on the wall to the left? Oh, oh. Um, Is it Ron Rudat Studio, perhaps? <laughs> uh, listeners, uh, Mark is referring to our interview uh, a year and a half ago with Ron Rudat, where he was live streaming in from his home studio and on the wall behind him was a life mask he had had cast of himself uh or is this supposed to be the mask that comes with the zartan action figure that's that's an alternative idea yeah yeah it does look very much like it the mask that i've always thought is shipwreck but (laughs) maybe maybe i'm the only person who thinks that i've got an, an an i spy of something that we don't see which is the that Cobra Commander, um, you know, has been shown to have this sort of distinctive-looking pistol uh, on him um, and on the front covers, and I had kind of made the assumption that it was like a Wolf a Wolfer P thirty eight Megatron pistol, and we, you know, we see it again on that table alongside those insect kind of devices that he's had in his pocket, and. Yeah, so what what we've not you know what we've not seen 
is that gun transforming into a giant robot? Maybe it is just a gun <laughs> and, and not Megatron, as I originally thought. Yeah, I keep going back and forth a little bit because Andrea Milana is a good enough artist that if he wanted it to look exactly like the original Megatron toy, he would. And this looks a lot like the original Megatron toy, but not exactly. There's a little bit of a diagonal to the the front part of it, and it's mostly black. So I'm not sure. And is that other little bit of black underneath the gun? Um, I'm not 100% sure if that's meant to be like a stock for the gun, like the Megatron uh, toy, or... Oh, on the, ta- on the table? Yeah, on the table, or a, a magazine of bullets to go in the gun. I th- the, the length of it makes me think it's probably meant to be a stock, which kind of point you more in the direction of it being Megatron-esque. Yeah, I took that. So on the table, we see four of the insect uh, devices and the gun and this rectangle that Mark thinks is a stock. I sort of thought that was one more just device, like a, you know, it looks sort of like an electric razor, uh, although maybe it's flatter than that. But I thought maybe this was, you know, like a uh, like a cutting laser. I know he already has the knife, a cutting laser or a homing beacon. I know that's in his sleeve. Uh, I, it, it didn't immediately jump out to me as a thing that connects to the gun, but maybe. Hmm. Um, so that was that was it for me. I think for the uh, for the ice spies. I didn't have any. <laughs> um, Z- Zorana has a normal motorcycle in the end of issue two. Yeah. Another thing we don't see on the interior of the book is a dreadnought swamp fire, despite it being on one of the front covers. Should, do we? Do you want to cover anything else, or should we maybe do? a um yo joe cola ranking on this uh, a dreadnought <laughs> grape soda ranking on this one it's yo joe time okay well, you go first uh, i'm gonna say eight i'm gonna say seven i'm not for my own sake offended by the violence i'm concerned that the violence puts a target on gi joe yeah, I think I, I think I had a probably a seven for issue two and almost a nine for issue three. I really liked issue three. Mm. Uh, I thought it was really powerful. Um, so sort of averaging out about uh, an eight overall for for these. O- overall, yeah, really enjoying Cobra Commander. Two more issues to come to to wrap up the series. I do get the sense that the eventual paperback collection of all five issues will be a satisfying and solid read. Mm. Um, we'll rack it in action at my store because that's where G.I. Joe goes, but it's a horror book and we have a horror section. So, mm. <laughs> well, I think it probably makes sense to keep most of the G.I. Joe stuff together in one, one place, yes. even if one carries maybe a warning label. Yeah. Although uh, Void, Void Rivals and Transformers are in sci-fi. So I think that is us done with uh, talking about Cobra Commander for now. Uh, we'll be back before very long talking about Cobra Commander, uh, probably four and five together, unless we can't uh, hold ourselves back from, from getting back and talking about them. We'll also be covering Duke four and five together. G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero 305, we've just been talking about recently, uh, and we'll back, be back talking about 306 before too very long. Uh, and then we've got uh, The Devil's Due Era, Read Through Continues, and we've got some special guests lined up as well. So uh, look forward to all of that. Uh, you can find out more about Talking Joe on the website talkingjoe.co.uk you can find out about us first uh, at patreon patreon.com slash talking joe where all of our backers are getting some early access and exclusive content those backers being richard sam jay bill christopher justin rob brian shane ryan simon and chris We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram. You can leave us a voicemail as well for future episodes. And all of the episodes are going out onto YouTube as an audio-only podcast. And some of those also get a video treatment. So if you are listening or watching 
on YouTube, make sure you hit like and subscribe. And uh, heck, why not leave a rating and review at your favorite podcast platform? Tim, where can people find you when you are not talking to me about G.I. Joe? Video essays on TV and film at our YouTube channel at Atomic Abe. My brick and mortar comic book store in Somerville, Massachusetts is Hub Comics, and I write about G.I. Joe at a real American book.com. Um, so I think with all that said, we are done. But remember that nobody beats talking Joe, an international podcast. Uh, laters. So much blood. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God.